This podcast is brought to you in part by the support of the AMTV patrons. Thank you. Hello there everybody and welcome back to another episode of AMTV Radio, the podcast where I'm joined by a very special guest each time and we just chat about, well, whatever we want, quite frankly. And this time I have, in my view, a Doctor Who legend. This man has been contributing to the community in the space of Doctor Who for several years, everything from managing the Doctor Who website to animations to writing stuff for Big Finish. I'd say he's quite literally done it all introducing james goss james thanks for coming on how are you scared now oh bless you. <laughs> i didn't mean to put the fear in you but I, I i think that's fair to say though like you have you've done so much in your many years contributing to doctor who is there no limit to my mediocrity <laughs> no oh don't knock yourself down like that man it's, it's, so um i mean i think to kick things off aptly i mean in to, bre- to skim over in the year that's been 2020, as it were, um, you've been able to consistently keep working, keep putting stuff out there. How have you found that in this sort of weird pandemic age, if you like, to keep working as you have been? Um, difficult. Uh, the, the worst thing was when I actually got COVID and I had it really, really mildly, mm. um, but I was really busy and I couldn't take any time off work. Uh yeah. And there, there, there was one day when I just couldn't stop throwing up. And it was just that really annoying thing about having to log on to a Zoom meeting and go, look, I'm just not going to be able to. And they're like, can you just talk 15 minutes? Like, no, no, no Thomas, no. <laughs> Give me a break, please. <laughs> just yeah. Um, and it was, it's just been really annoying because um, you end up with this absurd thing where you start to envy people who are on furlough because you're there going, I just feel like shit. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm having to... You know, I love an afternoon nap and and COVID naps were just not fun naps because your body would literally just switch off and you'd just watch your blood oxygen level go from 98 to 92. And then you'd go, I just have to go to bed now. Yeah. And you're just there going, I was just getting some work done. This is really annoying. And so you'd you'd find that you were just stuck in this thing where you check Twitter and it's lots of people going, I've got no work. And you're there going, it's 11 o'clock at night. (laughs) (laughs) No, I feel that it's been... As I think, as I said before we started recording, it's been a year, certainly. Like, it's just been insane. It's like we're all living in Hollyoaks, but on a really low budget, where (laughs) there's all drama for everyone all the time. And it's all just so dull. (laughs) Yeah, it's like you Zoom your mates. It's like, oh, what have you done today? I got out of bed, I guess. Which is like, you know, that's that's good in this day and age, I think, you know, considering. So, yeah, it's... um, you know, it it is really weird. I'm I'm lucky in some ways that for years, my idea of an of a brilliant evening is just curling up on the sofa with a book and some really nice bourbon, and oh, that's, that's been this year. Yeah. So you know that that great thing about going, oh well, I can just reread as much Agatha Christie as I want. Boom. Absolutely. Yeah, I think people have found a lot of that. People have had more time to read, or in my case, in, engage in audio drama because i think with all this it's like our lives are so busy in general that especially when i think the first lockdown happened we all sort of were able to take a bit more time to do those things would you agree with that or was it sort of business as usual for yourself yeah i mean it was it it was a weird mixture um because uh yeah that 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 first lockdown because i spent the week before flying out to turkey to rescue my parents who were on holiday oh man um because they're very, very old and they didn't have any idea that the apocalypse was happening. <laughs> so basically spending a week getting them onto a rescue flight and convincing them to go home. And my mother's mm. very, very, very pernickety in her frailness. Mm. So there was I trying to deal with work stuff. And at the same time, my mother going, well, I would like seat 7B. And you're going, mum, it's a rescue flight. You <laughs> just don't get, get to Just get on room. the plane. Get on the plane. Get back. Yeah. And she goes, but I don't understand. Why am I going to Newcastle? We don't live in Newcastle. And you go, it's a rescue flight. You have to leave the country. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, weirdly, coming back to lockdown for the first fortnight was just a relief. Because mm. um, it was just like a total lack of drama, which was really nice. And then the second fortnight was a bit dull. 
And mm. I don't know how you found it, but after a while, you just go, I'm really bored. Yeah, it was it was weird for me because I was uh, when the lockdown happened, I was two days away from opening a brand new musical, um, <laughs> which uh, like it was going to it was going to tour so around sorry. Yorkshire. No, it's all right. It was going to tour around Yorkshire. And it was like, oh, it was my first musical. And I was going to I was playing the lead and we were all excited. We're in tech week. And then, you know, the producers come in and say, yeah, guys, we uh, we can't really do this i mean understandably you know i'm not saying we should have done it like it was absolutely the right decision but you know when you get that close and you're just like oh like oh, at least one show your year. at least opening night but um you know hopefully yeah. the company's looking at getting some more arts council funding because some of the budget was dependent on that so i think the fingers are crossed it'll happen hopefully next year sometime but yeah but when lockdown happened i was like right well i'll focus on doing youtube then because before then it was just sort of the every now and then thing i did and now i had all this free time i was like oh i'll just do that and it like you say it was fun for like the first two weeks and then you suddenly like oh this is just becoming all i do isn't it because there's nothing else to do so um yeah lots of lots of ups and downs but you know i've been i i'd say as an actor i've been very lucky that i've been able to work here and there whether it's from home via doing you know work voiceovers or now doing this christmas driving panto so i've been very lucky considering a lot of people have sadly lost work and we seem to be getting no help from our our lovely government but we won't go too far into that but yeah no nope. no but um i think what one thing that has definitely lifted people's spirits this year especially in the doctor who community is the time lord victorious event which you are arguably one of the big brains behind so i know we're recording this in december so I understand there are things you can't reveal, so don't worry, I won't go there. And um, but in terms of just the concept of it, was Time Lord Victoria something you and and your team sort of devised before the pandemic hit? Like, was this long time planning, or was it just? Oh, we'd be working on it for about six months beforehand. Okay. Um, and you know, it take it takes time to put together something that that big. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I I did kind of think. Uh, at the end of March, that maybe we'd have a meeting and all go, well, maybe we shouldn't. But actually, the the overwhelming thing, all the licensees are great. Hmm. Um, and they were all determined that they were just going to carry on with it, which was genuinely very moving. Hmm. Um, I, I have problems doing sincere emotion. It was a bit weird being on a Zoom call and thinking, oh, I am doing the eye leaking thing. <laughs> Is that just because it was it, it was it it was a real licensee sort of I am Spartacus moment where everyone was like no no I am doing the books we are doing the comics we are doing the audio <laughs> dramas and you there going oh man oh that's so good though because as you say I think especially in that first lockdown when it was so you know severe it could have easily was there like a doubt in your head like it could have easily just like some bits may not have come to fruition or once you heard that Zoom call were you like yeah we got this we can do this. Yeah, well, you know, I just didn't know because that that first week of lockdown, everyone was so pessimistic about everything. Mm. And also the BBC had done the amazing thing of just announcing, don't worry, we'll educate your kids. Yeah, We will put on the most entertaining iPlayer catalogue we could possibly make. You know, the BBC had genuinely pulled off a thing that made everybody go, wow. Mm. And they'd pulled it off in like four days flat. Yeah, <laughs> And you think, Wow. By the time they've done that, they can probably sit down and take the rest of the year off from coming up with other stuff. And I just kind of assume that people go, well, this is a lovely project, but maybe we'll pick it up in a bit. Yeah. But everyone's like, no, that's what we're doing. No, I mean, that's just fantastic. I think it just shows the resilience of people who are committed to these sorts of projects, especially since uh, Time of Victoria spans so many different formats and uh, mediums. And I mean, we've all recently been watching the Daleks animated series, which recently concluded on on YouTube. Um, how did you find the overall reaction to that? Have you seen any of like the reviews or what people are, are making of it? I quite enjoyed it myself. Well, I I I, I avoided the reviews for it. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's been a lot of very positive reaction that people let me know about, but I was just kind of like, oh, I just can't take a kicking. <laughs> you know, there, there was that wonderful David Tennant quote from when he was interviewed by Catherine Tate and she was mocking him about newspaper reviews. And he said something like, oh, when somebody comes up and goes, oh no, I've seen the reviews, David. It's like, it, it's that thing where it's like, I just, you know, yeah. I'm quite happy to let fandom be fandom. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, if people have enjoyed it, hooray. If people <laughs> who haven't enjoyed it, 
thank God they didn't at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I, I think that's completely fair. I mean, is that your is that your approach to like your your work in general? Like, say when you do the audios and stuff, do you just sort of say, "Here's my work. I've put it out there. If you enjoy it, great. If you don't, okay, whatever." Yeah, because um, you know that it, it's it, it's a curious thing that. Um, one of the things I've, I've learned about being involved in Doctor Who is that people want to mark your homework from 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, which is <laughs> fucking bizarre. Uh, you know, most fandom is amazing, but you will get people going, so I've heard this rumor about a thing that you worked on in 2001. And you go, I can't remember 2001. Yeah, yeah, like, and they're going, well, we've done some research and this is what you think. And you go, oh, that's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and I can't remember that. And they're like, "Well, we want you to confirm that this is what you did with the button." And you're like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's the, like Doctor is the only industry where you work on a thing and you get genuine emails from people asking you about how you spent your budget in your job 15, 17 years ago, yeah. and you think <laughs> that can't happen to anyone else. Yeah. No, I've noticed you know, that. I've noticed that at conventions, the few I've been to, where various doc, whether they be you know stars or production crew or writers like yourself, you know, and people will ask that. Oh, so in this thing in two thousand and two, um, the budget was supposedly this. So did you spend this much on this and this much on that? And then bless them, they're on the stage as well, going like, not a clue. Like your guess is as good as mine. It's it's a very nitpicky space sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, um, mostly. It isn't. Mm. Um, and the thing is, the 97% of interactions that make you go, oh, I love you, <laughs> um, are amazing. But it's the 3% that just make you go, oh, well, that's yeah. been done for the day. Um, yeah, it can really, I mean, not that I've, I've not written anything or anything like that. But even when, I think it, there's a similarity with, you know, people who make, say, stuff on YouTube. If you put a lot of time or effort into a video you're genuinely proud of, and then you might just see that one comment, you know, of someone bashing you, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly. And like you say, it just sucks it all out of you. And you think, oh, well, that's enough Internet for me today. Yeah. But, you know, the mute button, the mute button is your that's, friend. That's the oh, I've been using it on Twitter. Don't you worry. So it's been yeah. very it's come in handy uh, numerous times. So because blocking is aggressive. Um, mm. I remember when I when I started on Torchwood for Big Finish, I did get some really very firm tweets from people hmm. and it was a bit sort of like whoa that's a bit full on and yeah. i was just like i'm just pressing block and running away and then unfortunately you then got them very loudly getting their friends to get in touch to go why have uh, you blocked it's... and you just think oh wow this is such a political thing so ever since then i've just been like oh well that wasn't a nice thing to say mute yeah no i think that that's the better way to go absolutely but yeah, we ta we I, time know, I block ho I block homophobes and transphobes because absolutely, yeah. um, but also because they kind of thrive on being blocked. That's the reason why they get out of bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, everything else is just a thing where you just go, well, I don't agree with that, and I wish you hadn't told me that. But mute, you know, no, where you go with your opinions, enjoy them. Yeah, I think you're right though about the whole muting concept because I've, I, you know, I'm guilty before of engaging with people on Twitter who as you say, are clearly their life's, or not life, sorry, their day's purpose is to get up and say mean things, basically. And I would at first try and engage in like a conversation, try and argue back. But I think that's just fruitless because they thrive on those comments and they just go on and on and on. And so, yeah, muting them just is a lot more, a lot less stressful, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I did have a brief bump earlier this year where there, there was a campaign, there was a series of memes about how cool it was to pirate Big Finish. Oh. Um, and I got involved in that because Big Finish is just such a small company. Yeah. Uh, and I had this, this incredible sort of righteous thing from people going, Big Finish are a really big company. They employ 87 people. And you're there going, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it, was, like, it was people using facts they had found from the internet to prove yeah, that I was facts. wrong. And they're going, <laughs> so, oh, well, I, uh, you know, there, there really aren't 80 people working in the office at Big Finish. There's three. Yeah. It's, it's a really small company. And anyway, you shouldn't be nicking stuff from, you know, the, no. the idea that you sort of set up a whole thing about, well, where 
where is it all right for you to be a ma- to be a pirate? Is it it's still illegal? Yeah. But it's... the thing is, Big Finish are such a small firm doing so much good, and people pirating from them. It's it's just awful, especially no. because you know it it isn't hard, but every lost sale is genuinely a lost sale with Big Finish. Yeah, and these are the same people who say stuff like, "Well, you know, the reason why I pirate stuff from Big Finish is because the price is so expensive." And you go, "Big Finish's CDs—they actually cost the same as when they launched in 1999." Hmm. So, you know, it's you know yeah. those evil, vile capitalists at Big Finish who've kept the prices the same yeah, for exactly. 21 years. <laughs> oh, those. Those money yeah. squeezing. That conglomerate. <laughs> yeah. You know, the big finisher as far as you can get away from being an evil corporation. Yeah. And you, you just have to look at the, you know, what especially hurt about all of this, yes, let's pirate from big finish, was just how amazing big finish have been during lockdown. They've yeah. been keeping actors and writers employed who don't have work. Mm. Big Finish have found a way to record. Big Finish could just have turned around and gone, do you know what? We're just going to leave it for six months. Mm-hmm. And instead yeah. of which, they found ways of building home studios. They provided technical support. They've, they have bought microphones for actors. Yeah, They've kitted out home studios. They've done so much work to keep people employed. Mm. You know, what they've done is amazing. Yeah. I'm not going to say Big Finish is a perfect company who are perfect at everything all the time, but my God, this year, what they've done, they should be winning awards for what they've done. No, absolutely. And, and instead of which you've got people going, yes, pirate from Big Finish, drive them out of business. And you think, oh man, that's just mean. Yeah, but I think it's also these same people, as you say, don't realise that Big Finish, or you know, as you say, keeps actors employed, writers employed. Like they don't see the bigger picture of it, and one thing, well, I know is like I believe is it like some of the sets available to to pre order, like um they the money from those pre orders helps fund future productions. So like the fact we're getting so much content is from uh, partly from the from the support that the fandom shows. So yeah, that's just that's just evil to just say oh let's I mean pirate you, you shouldn't pirate anyway. Anyone listening, don't pirate. It's illegal. It's theft. But yeah, that's that's terrible. But I mean, as you say, it's brilliant how Big Finish have continued and gone the extra mile to keep creating works for people to listen to and enjoy. I was listening to some of the the monthly range that was produced during lockdown. And obviously, when you hear it, you don't think twice. You know, the quality is still that same quality. It's only in the behind the scenes at the end of the disc when, you know, you have an actor saying, oh, well, we recorded this during the lockdown that you go, oh, yeah, like this was recorded during a national pandemic and they weren't all in the same room. So... The fact they've maintained that high quality, I think, is incredible. Yeah, but at the same time, I really miss studios. Oh man, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> it is. It is. Im- it is impossible to explain. There's, there is something lovely about being able to produce a day's worth of audio drama while sat in bed with a cat. But at the same time, it's like I actually miss wearing big boy trousers and being in an office <laughs> and getting to make actors cups of tea and yeah. sitting and talking with them over lunch and. And just just that thing of getting through an entire day without the Wi-Fi going down. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. Like when you've done it, then has that been a has that been a constant problem, or just every now and then like Wi-Fi dropouts and such? Like something something bad technically happens every day, um, mm. and that's that that's no one's fault. No, the uh, actors are not trained studio engineers, and when you're in studio engineers are constantly going into the booths to just just tweak that microphone a little bit just just and they can't because sometimes they're 200 miles away from the actors yeah and it is it is just difficult and complicated and we all know that broadband connections are not reliable no uh and um yeah think things are just really very difficult and uh, the fact that actors have just heroically learned how to do this stuff. Mm. You know, they've built themselves home studios, people like you who've gone, which is the quietest room in my house? How can I improve the sound insulation in this room? Um, what kit do I need? Um, 
you know, you, you end up having slightly frightening conversations with actors where you're sort of going, well, I hope you've got a nice plug in USB microphone instead of which they start lecturing you on their plus minus DB levels. And you're just going, <laughs> Oh God. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is very easy to just sort of have this idea of mocking actors and thinking, Oh, well, bless them. Those precious little flowers. They aren't going to be able to learn how to do this kind of stuff. Actors are amazing. Actors spend all their lives having three or four different professions on the go yeah. and learning new skills as they go. And, you know, the way that actors have just gone, yes, I will learn how to record in professional studio quality. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, I yeah, think act actors are very yeah. adaptable, as you say, on, yeah. on the whole, because they have to be to a lot of, you know, to such an extreme. But no, well, I mean, a testament, I mean, a big thanks and testament to you and all the writers and actors well, it's, at it, Big it's, Finish. It's, so. most, it's mostly Scott Hancock hmm. as, as the director. Scott is just the most fantastic person to work with. And Scott's ability when Clean Feed came along to go, I am an expert in Clean Feed. And I'm there going, oh, well, oh, this looks modern. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I had to learn how it worked in the end. But luckily, um, for the first few recordings, I could just be like, oh, Scott, I'm just, oh, I'm still a little bit faint from the COVID. So I'll just, I'll just sit in and watch you do the magic, uh, yeah. which was... Um, utterly weasel skills from me but meant that i could actually when when i finally had to pretend to know how to produce a clean feed recording mm. i'd actually got to watch scott do it and it was just like oh wow oh that is really yeah. incredible but also the engineers that big finish use you know people like jack and paul who are just phenomenal at having mm. you know the, these are people who are happiest in a studio mm. And, and they're sat just gently coaxing studio quality performances out of actors spread out across the country. Yeah. No, it, it is phenomenal. Like you say, Big Finish should win some sort of award for being able to continue as they have, given all the circumstances. Yeah. I mean, even as we speak right now, they're, they're still producing content and new stories for us to listen to yeah. and enjoy. You know, which I... compared, compared to The Archers, and I've loved The Archers since I was your age, probably. Mm. Uh, and, and The Archers has had a horrible year yeah. you've probably not heard any of the archers this year uh, have not you? this year in fact fun fact is my my dissertation at university was about the archers oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah managed you... to get a 2-1 so <laughs> congratulations thank you um so so yeah you you will understand my pain when i say the archers has leapt off the cliff during the pandemic Yes, um, I haven't become... heard many of them, but I've I've read you know people writing about how it's leapt off a cliff edge, so to speak. So yeah, it is. It is. It, it it's it's been like a dear old friend going through a terrible illness this year, yeah. but you know it's it's got back to how it used to be, and 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 we're all glad that uh, <laughs> we we are back to not having to listen to the inner thoughts of people who have no inner thoughts. <laughs> Uh, or the f the best kind of drama, obviously. So yeah. yeah, you just felt so badly for those actors having to do sort of deeply thought out monologues about bees in trees. Yeah, and you're going, oh no. <laughs> yeah, not the bees in the trees. Like no. Oh bless him. I've actually noticed that. I don't watch it myself, but my my mum and dad are avid watchers of them, um, EastEnders. And I know I don't know if they're still doing it, but when they picked up, you know, filming again because they slowed down a bit and then picked up. They said it all looked normal, but then I think it said there were scenes where either actors were sh sharing a, an emotional moment where obviously for safety reasons, they were either between like, you know, a pane of transparent glass or a distance. And obviously it's hard, isn't it? Because in an emotional scene, like you might want to go and hug someone or whatever. And they were like, they were clearly told that they can't, they can't do that. So then when you watch it on screen, you think, oh, those, this woman's crying in a corner and this man's just sort of standing really far away going yeah it'll, it'll be all right dear it'll be all right and it's just like you know i mean it, it is it's not their fault but um i think tv especially has had to make major changes and adapt but i mean i've always said from the beginning thank god they're still filming like even doctor who now they're going again like who thought they'd actually go again this year yeah well the the um you know if you want to learn anything about um being covid secure go and get a job on a soap because mm. uh, I, I have friends who work on Inside Soap magazine and they say set visits are extraordinary. Yeah. You know, the, these are um, properly, uh, you know, it, it's like entering a hazmat environment. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just fantastically run 
the the soaps have really learned how to innovate and be amazing this year um yeah which... and then there's casualty in a corner being like oh the storylines we can come up with now so you know rubbing know, their fingers nobody, together nobody wants that no, That's no, of course. That's a real shame. Mm. Um, you know, we've all spent years going, oh, pandemics, they're great to write about. And then suddenly this year, everyone's like, could we not? Yeah. Have a pandemic again? Although I've, although I've already seen, isn't it? I think I think it's Michael Bay's helming a movie. I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's like set in 2024 and like COVID has mutated and now like nine tenths of the world's population are gone. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just like, surely this is way like too soon. Read the room. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why would you want to make a movie like this whilst we're still going through it? Yeah, As you I say, mean, you who only wants have to, to see that? You only have to look at the crown to see that people are still going, oh, Princess Die, too soon. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I mean, from an acting perspective, I loved the new series of The Crown myself. I thought Emma Corrin was sublime as Diana, but yeah, I know there's a lot of comments about obviously historical accuracy and hot topics and all that sort of stuff. So, did you watch it yourself? I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward okay. to Josh O'Connor's performance enormously because mm. you know he's just one of those magnetic actors that you just like. Oh my word! Yeah. Um. You know when somebody is sort of like hot, ugly, or just <laughs> you know they they have this sort of magnetic weirdness to yeah. them. Oh well, um, you're gonna love him in season four, then. Trust yeah. me. So. <laughs> Everything I've seen him. He was even in. I was watching Emma the other day. Hmm. Uh, and he plays the most incredible, uh, his Mr. Elton is incredible, absolutely incredible. It, it's such a teeth on edge performance all the way through. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it, you know, he's just one of those actors where you're just like, oh God, I could watch you. Yeah, um, very watchable actor, which is what you want yeah. really, especially in something like The Crown, which is so all about, you know, scenery and uh, the look of it all and the presentation. No, it's brilliant. I think you'll, I think you'll really enjoy it. But um, on the note of history, we're going to go back in, in your history yourself, all the way back to the early 2000s, a golden age in uh, pop culture, in my opinion. But hey, I was like five or six, so of course it was. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I hate that. It's like when people go, oh, I loved your website. I really liked that when I was at school. And I go, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll not say that then, but um, hint, hint, I did. Um, so, um you were like the head honcho in many ways of the, what was the, I think first the BBC cult website that had Doctor Who and then what became the revamped Doctor Who website. So um, how did you, how did you fall into that position? Is it something you worked up to or was it something you were just assigned to? And how did you find it in an era pre-2005 before Doctor Who was back? How was it running a website for a program that on TV was technically seen as dead? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I got the job by accident because the guy, Rory Edmonds, who was the guy who was in charge of all the BBC's drama departments, the cult websites were run by an ex-nun uh, who didn't oh. watch television. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> and sort of vaguely refused to have anything to do with Buffy the Vampire Slayer because it was about Satan. Yeah. And uh, so he went, well, you've watched this stuff don't you like Doctor Who and stuff? Can you come and look after it? And it was, um, and that, that was sort of it. It wasn't really a, a complicated job interview, but the, you know, you, you had to in those days seem too cool for school a bit. Yeah. You know, there's a very different approach now where people are allowed to say, Oh my God, I love all that stuff to mm. them where it's like, Oh yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, if I could, if I could go back in time, I would take some of the, Oh yeah. Edge off. Yeah. off the, those sites but that was that was how you had to be because it was the tail end of Britpop. pop yes. um yeah. you know it was that it was that sad thing where i would unironically and absolutely adorably jog into work every day listening to the venga boys and steps yes. and then sort of quietly change and then go oh yeah let's be really snide about bagpuss today yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you just turn, and you suddenly look back and go oh mate no um yeah. but that that was you know the the ethos um was was very blokey in mm. in the department which was extraordinary because most of the websites were actually senior content produced by women but there was still because the management team was quite boy yeah uh, it was all a bit oh um you know you weren't allowed to enthusiastically enjoy anything um yeah. it always had to have that little kind of like little nod yeah. and you're just there going 
oh, I just want to take screen grabs of Blake Seven, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know that uh, that awful thing about um being in a very very uh oh this is going to go so badly this story but never mind um <laughs> there there was there there was one um there was one manager in the department who who quite liked a sniffy toilet break oh, and yes. <laughs> uh, normally before a development meeting and there was a guy who thought that he was about to get the rights to Blake 7 hmm. so I was in a meeting with this really nice very sweet very sincere guy and me because the department went oh yeah he's he's watched Blake 7 he can sit in the meeting with you um and and this guy comes back from his sniffy loo break and sits down and goes boom right Got it, right? <laughs> gambling and lesbians. That's what's missing from Blake 7. Gambling and lesbians. <laughs> Fucking gambling and lesbians. That's what we need. Oh, yeah. And we need a pop culture hook. What can we do? And I kind of was just like, fuck it. And just yeah. said it. Because I just thought, I cannot bear this meeting. And for two weeks, Blake's Club 7 was in development. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that thing where you just walk past a whiteboard and go, Jesus, nobody yeah. spotted this. <laughs> Blake's but yeah, club you know that. Yeah, I know. I know. You just, <laughs> yep, yep. See, that ages me. That ages <laughs> you. Oh, see, to anyone listening, this proves the early two thousands was a magical time to be to be around. Clearly, <laughs> but, um, no, <laughs> that's one word for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in the end, we actually got a. Um, the, the company culture changed remarkably when our department got a female boss. Hmm. Weird that. Um, yeah. But uh, we did have these weird meetings every year where she'd go, well, Doctor Who, you know, how much longer do you think we've got in it? Because um, hmm. it, was, it was a bit of an anomaly because it was genuinely, the Doctor Who and cult sites were some of the BBC's most popular websites. Hmm. Uh, and they had a really tiny amount of money, most of which was stolen to moderate forums that were unbearable pits of hate. Oh, um, and, you know, it was it was always heartbreaking seeing that most of your budget, you know, enough to buy a small family house would go every hmm. year on moderating people yelling at each other. And you'd go, yeah. oh, um, yeah. can we not spend that making stuff? Mm. Uh, and you'd have meetings where um, moderators would say things like, it, "We've we've got it down to only seventy pence to moderate each message." And you go, "Oh, I could spend that pence. money. I could make stuff." Yeah, you know the stuff that the cult site and the Doctor Who site made. Some of that is still watched. Some of it's still up there. Um, but yeah, there was a real thing every year where my boss would just go, "How much longer do you think Doctor Who's got in it?" Um, we're going to have to look at putting the plug. What's what's your next project going to be? And then Doctor Who came back, and that was not easy. Um, but, you know, that, that first year was very interesting because um, I became really good friends with Ian Grutchfield, who was the brand manager of Doctor Who. Uh, mm. Ian is the one of the great unsung heroes of Doctor Who. Ian is the just has this incredible strategic mind. Ian was one of the people who went, we would really need to have Dalek toys on the shelves for 2005 Christmas. Yeah. You know, that, that was Ian. Ian was the man driving the bandwagon when nobody wanted to jump on it. And so mm. Ian and I would basically be driving around the, the tractor fields of the BBC, Ian driving this, this bandwagon. And we sort of sat slightly nervously and Ian going, if you put a foot wrong, we will end your career. Um, and you just have all these meetings going, Doctor Who's going to be brilliant. People are like, yeah, 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 no. And then Doctor Who happened and it was brilliant. Mm. And, and you just, the, the weird bun fight, it was almost preferable to the, the previous thing where you just sat there trying to build a website with people going, oh, well, it's Doctor Who. It's not going to go anywhere. Just suddenly people going, hi, so I think I should be your manager now. <laughs> Uh, by the time I left, I, me I remember a meeting with HR uh, where I said, because uh, I got into terrible trouble because I wasn't listening to this person who was convinced that she was my manager. And I ended up drawing out this orga organization chart and going, so here are my 17 managers. Where are you in this? <laughs> and the guy from HR was like, oh, this is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, you know, it, it did get a little bit tangled once Doctor Who became this incredibly popular thing because, you know, Russell and Judy were the most brilliant people to work for imaginable. Mm. You know, the, the words cannot describe how brilliant Russell is as a human being, as a writer, as somebody to work for. But also, you know, the, the BBC was just a very, very 
big organization in those days and there was that real sense of just this inrush towards something that was incredibly popular mm. um and you know how can i make a difference i i used to dread when somebody would turn up and go how can i make your life better because you'd be like oh no i know how this is going to end mm. um but you know that that was a long long time ago um and you know working with bbc studios again uh this last year it's been incredible hmm. just the the cultural change because there was a bit of me that was like oh no it's like being made to you know that nightmare you have about having to go back to school yeah <laughs> you know it was sort of that where i was like oh no and instead i just turned up was like oh wow everyone's lovely hmm. and nothing horrible happened what um <laughs> you know it's it's really strange to describe but um hmm. No, yeah. I think one of one of my favourite features on the on the old site. I think it was just as series one of the revived era was was airing because I think it'd been released as like a prelude. It was those three videos called the Doctor Who Years, where it was oh, clips of. Oh God, I, I love... love I loved those. Like as a kid, I, I had those I, on repeat. I absolutely. They were done by um, Pete Crocker and Ed Stradling, and they they'd done them for the convention circuit. And basically, I'd worked out that there was. There's a uh, a rights loophole that existed at the time where you couldn't put full music tracks up online, but mm. you could put 30 seconds of a music track up online. Mm. So I said, look, can we pay you to re-edit these things to put only 30 seconds of each track in? And they were both like, no, that would be really <laughs> horrible. And I'm like, it can't go online unless it's 30 seconds of each track. And they both did an amazing job. And we we did a lovely sort of slightly Samizdat um, trade in DVD copies of all of them. Um, Cause they were just a really sweet way. And it was, it was also one of those things that we talked about and we said, you know, this is a really nice way of honoring the history of Doctor Who, but without doing a thing that's all about old Doctor Who. Cause there was a real nervousness uh, about how the BBC would treat the history of Doctor Who certainly for that first year because mm. um, there was a real terror that every time a news program would feature Doctor Who to talk about the revival they would pull the shittest clip they could find out of the archives just so that you know that that attitude that we spoke about yeah you know that whole well you might remember Doctor Who is the green monsters and the wobbly sets ha ha <laughs> shows clip of green monsters and wobbly sets anyway yeah. joining us in the studio is an incredibly awkward looking Christopher Eccleston <laughs> you know it's it, it was that sort of sense of mentality and that was one of the things that Russell was very keen to sort of stamp out the fact you know you couldn't be snide you had mm. to be embracing the joy of Doctor Who. Uh, mm. And that's one of the, the things. You look back at that 2005 series, it's joyous. Yeah. That is the main thing. It's all yeah. about somebody running and laughing. And, and that's sort of the, the energy that started uh, with that first year of Russell's and continued. The fact that it was a television series that was genuinely joyous to watch. Yeah, And I think and, the revival of Doctor Who, the reason why it's still going is because they're still running and laughing. That's, yeah. that's the thing that's persisted. Um, no, I think um, you're right. I mean, that first series, I remember, because before that, I always remember the trailer, you know, Chris looks up and he goes, you want to come with me? Like, I remember seeing that for the first time, because before then, I'd never heard of Doctor Who at all. You know, I was born in 1996, so I guess it was at an era where you know, unless I'd seen, you know, the books or anything like that or the audios, I wouldn't have heard of it, I suppose. Um, and I remember my dad was watching the trailer with me and he said, ah, this is coming back, is it? Oh, you'll like this. We'll watch this. And that whole first series was just, as you said, so joyous because it didn't re it didn't make you as the viewer rely on, oh, well, you, you've had to have watched all 26 seasons of the original show to understand what's going on here. You had the odd, like, callback isn't there like there's a line about unit and you see a cyberman helmet and all that sort of stuff but as you say yeah it's such a joy to watch and i think it, it's it's held up so well over the last 15 yeah years. and the you know that one of the most joyous evenings i had was looking after the doctor who inbox the first night of rose oh, man. uh because it was something that never happens before because people don't email the bbc hmm. on if they do they generally want something and this was 
dads sending photographs of terrified kids to us oh. and being like, look at this. <laughs> and it was, it was that weird dad pride of, you know, slightly terrified kids peering from behind curtains. And you look back and go, well, from a GDPR point of view, this is probably a bit bumpy. But for one glorious evening in 2005, you were just there going, oh, God, Russell, my inbox is full of crying kids. Um <laughs> You know, and it's it, it's a, it's an interaction that you just never happened in in history before. And just actually looking at the inbox and going, we have this incredible influx of positive emails, hmm. and you know, getting to spend the next thirteen weeks. And this is this is a thing that's very hard to explain to you because you are so young. But just getting <laughs> emails from mums and dads going, listen, I am the worst parent ever. I forgot to set the video when we went away. When can I watch a repeat of this episode? And the fact that the website team were frantically scouring the BBC Three schedules and going, okay, Wednesday, 2 a.m., there's another showing a parting of the waves. Mm. Uh, you know, it was, it was that real thing of, um, you know, the Buffy fans were, were very numerous and reasonably easy to deal with. Uh, but the Doctor Who fans that suddenly came thundering into the inbox during that first season, they were really engaged and they were really desperate to watch the show. There wasn't an iPlayer. The yeah. DVDs weren't out for like a month or so. Mm. And there was a real feeling of, a, you know, that, that thing of Doctor Who was not just appointment to view, it was a family appointment to view, which mm. was extraordinary. You know, that's, that, that was a thing that just didn't exist. Yeah, I think for those first few revived series, as you say, it was like the last the last little bit of that era of, you know, you either had to watch it on broadcast or tape it, otherwise you were relying on a repeat, or if that wasn't happening, a, a home media release. I feel like those series were the last time, for Doctor Who at least, that happened. I've still got in my storeroom somewhere, I found, I was clearing out during lockdown, and I found two blank VHS tapes, and I thought, I wonder if there's anything on here, so I slotted them in. And what and one of them was a on transmission recording of Blink, oh. and I was like, oh my goodness! And then it all came back. I was like, oh yes, because I was at so and so's birthday party, and I'd said to my mum, oh you've got to record Doctor Who, and and then for some reason I just sat and watched Blink on a fuzzy old VHS tape just because it was there, and I was like, this is so weird. And then funnily enough, it led into the final of um any uh, was it any dream will do with um you know that andrew lloyd webber show yep. so then there's a young graham norton on the screen i'm like what is this tape like where, why do i have this wow. but yeah i think it was those few seasons because i think really when iplayer came out and the dvds became more frequent or you know closer to broadcast coming out i feel that it's still family appointment viewing to a degree but would you would you agree that that it sort of slid a little bit as things have become a lot more digital and we've got more options to watch as opposed to just on broadcast I think we've, you know, everyone's uh, way that they view stuff has changed, but at the same time, it's starting to change back. Uh, you know, you, you look at the way that The Mandalorian and Discovery have reintroduced the whole, well, you're going to watch this on Friday, aren't you? <laughs> and, you know, that, that is a real genius thing where we're, we're so used to the idea of we must watch all of the episodes now. Uh, and instead it's like, no, 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 I've got to watch one a week. And if I don't watch it on Friday, uh, my, my Twitter feed is going to be toast on Saturday because it's going to be lots of people going, yeah, but that. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, I, there's always something magical that I think about watching something one a week, especially if it's like a serialized thing with cliffhangers like Doctor Who was like, I'll, I'll never forget seeing just the first one that popped into my head you know, um, Stolen Earth, David Tennant's regenerating. We'd never heard about this. And everyone's going, oh my God, for a week in, you know, the playground, like, what's what's going to happen? Is he going to change? Is it going to be this, that? And I th when you think back on it, like, that was such a fun time, you know, with your mates just talking. Well, it, was a, it was a fun time for you. I was in hospital dying. Uh, I oh, was, bless you. I, I was literally um, very, very, very seriously ill in hospital. And, and I was there going, oh, well, at least at least, you know, it's Friday now and there's a Doctor Who on Saturday. I'll watch one more. And it was Turn Left. And I'm the only person ever to have not enjoyed Turn Left on transmission, partly because I was throwing up and partly because I was there going, Doctor Who's not in it. My last ever episode of Doctor Who oh, is not right. bloody in it. And I got to the end and went, well, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, I can probably manage another week. And just getting through this awful, awful week uh, and finally getting to the stolen earth and going, Oh, well, at least, 
at least death can take me now. Um, and, you know, missing Penelope Wilton's death because my head was in a bucket uh, and just thinking, oh, Christ. Well, anyway, and then getting to that cliffhanger and going, oh, no, I've got to live another fucking week. <laughs> and it was, it was, you know, it, it was that real thing of on the one hand, you know, those episodes of Doctor Who were so special to me because they were literally, it was the first time in my life I was ever aware of the whole thing about a cliffhanger that I might never get to see resolved. You know that thing, if you get to the end of The Stolen Earth and you just there go, oh my God, this is so exciting. I can't wait to see what happens next. And I'm there going, a week. Oh God, a week. That is a long time. We are really yeah. risking things here. Uh, and that was, that, that was a real salutary kind of change in my viewing habits. Um, mm. You know, I, I had a friend who was, oh, a few years later diagnosed with cancer during um 2013 and just the way that the the doctor Who production office just very quietly were just going look um do you want to see day of the doctor early and he was there going on the one hand i do but on the other hand that is kind of giving in mm. no that must have wow that's that's a heavy yeah. choice because you you see that, don't you? With the uh, the one I remember was when they did the first of the new you know the new Star Wars films, and I think it was a young boy who was um, terminally ill, and he got to see the Force Awakens early. I know every circumstance is different, but that's I respect that because I guess I see what you mean about oh, is it gi it's giving in in that way if you sort of whereas if you wait out, it might make it more special seeing it, especially with that episode, you know that big uh, culmination of the of the 50th which was i mean we all remember it it was insane and did you watch it at home or were you in a cinema or i i did watch it at home but then i went with lee binding to watch it in the cinema the next week um mm. which was just you know wasn't that joyous yeah uh, yes doctor who on the big screen and it's not a peter cushing film <laughs> i know and that's yeah. the only thing that's wrong with it <laughs> um <laughs> But, no, you know, absolutely. It, it, is, it is great that there there is this whole thing of um, people getting together and watching stuff. Because I remember uh, when I was at Channel Four, they did these things called Skins watching parties, and I'm now aware that you're mm. too young to even know what a Skins was. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm aware of Skins. Don't worry. Yeah. But <laughs> but uh, for for the youth of many years ago, it was quite the racy little program, uh, mm. and. And you would go to these screening parties, which were insane. Mm. It was all of these, you know, it was, it was like the TV version of Beatlemania, where people would get together and watch episodes of Skins, and uh, they would talk about them on the Bebo, um, which, uh, you know, hi, Bebo. That's going back. So. I know. Um, <laughs> God, real player Bebo, I've outlived them all. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was a real kind of like, wow moment and to actually see doctor who start to do screenings at a similar time and then have have this similar impact with the audience you know those those joyous stephen moffat era screenings where people would sort of be queuing around the block in new york to see the season premiere and you go that is amazing you know mm. the, the fact that doctor who's gone from being something that just felt like this private little passion to you know there's there's now this real feeling of well yes you are very old and you can shut up now uh because it's you know it's no longer my little show that i have all the vhs's of it's fucking now it's everyone's show and the fans that exist now just have this incredible passion for it um you know the the way that my my uh very old bbc head is just there going you run an etsy store selling non-licensed Doctor Who merchandise. That's wrong. But also, I really want one of those cushions. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to explain. But the sheer unabashed passion, that is the great gift that new Doctor Who's given us. You know, there, there are mm. weird corners of Twitter where people just sit there and go, everything about everything is awful. But there's also this thing where there's, there's this incredible amount of fans who just sit there and go, I love this so much, I'm embroidering a cushion. Mm. And you can't actually get past that being unconditional love for something. Absolutely. And I think when you hear how many people, both, pe you know, of 
New Who and Classic Who say how it, you know, it's either helped change their life for the better or given them some really positive memories, help them find a partner or, you know, these are incredible. And when you see stories like that, you think, wow, this was all down to, you know, one television show. Like, the, as, as you say, at one time was seen as this quirky little sci-fi thing that, that the cool kids didn't watch. And now, as you say, it's literally everywhere. Everyone at least knows the name or is aware of Doctor Who as a programme. And um, I mean, I think the tweet alongs during lockdown, you know, that Emily Cook's been organizing. Oh my God, yes. Like, I think they just show what you say, like the passion people have, like watching these episodes and going on Twitter and seeing people go, oh, I remember watching this and wasn't this brilliant and this scene's incredible and you've got the, the writers coming on board or some of the actors. I think I think those, amongst many other things during lockdown, um, as you say, just shows how much this show is still loved so all those people who say well doctor who died like in 2017 blah 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 it's like okay if you think that you know i sorry sorry that you think like that but it very clearly isn't you know so yeah i mean what emily's done with the tweet alongs has been amazing uh and you know the fact that that is purely emily she's not paid to do that um she's she's not doing it to build up the massive brand of emily cook she's just mm. doing it because she's nice emily is one of the genuinely nicest people you could ever meet um but you know we had a lovely foretaste of it with you remember you remember the twitch doctor who on twitch oh yes you know old, old fans that there was something for everyone because old fans could sit there and go oh my god children are watching the chase <laughs> and they're loving it the chase is brilliant. I think yes, like, it's just, yeah. correct. <laughs> no, yeah, you, like you it, say nothing more. It's it's six episodes of madness, but I mean that's what's so brilliant about it. It's just unabashedly, unashamedly bonkers, and it's like, yep. look, we're it, we're in a like, Hammer House of Horrors thing. Look, Dracula's picking up a Dalek, and you're just like, yep. Okay, cool. Like, I'm down with this. This is cool. <laughs> I, I, I remember the, the sheer joy of interviewing Richard Martin a few years ago for a DVD extra, and he turned up and obviously is, was as Richard Martin as you could hope. And he was just like, oh, yes, I watched the DVD you sent me the other night, but I think there was something wrong with it because people's heads kept on going missing out of the top of shots. And, oh, no. and he looked at us and we looked at him and he went, I wasn't quite that bad, was I? And we're going, oh, maybe it was just a setting on your TV. Yeah, um, skirt and just around it. You down know. And telling us the absolute chaos of trying to make the chase with whatever they had to hand. Mm. And, you know, I went into interviewing Richard Martin, loving him. Mm. And I came out just going, not only do I love you, but the fact that you managed to make anything given what you're up against. And just mm. the fact that it was basically Verity Lambert just pinning him up against a wall in television centre going, just do it, Richard. And you're just thinking, wow. Yeah. And, you know, it makes the chase even more adorable. And, and also it gives us the mechanoids. And I love the mechanoids. Mm. Hey, who were actually in Daleks, of course, the animated series, yep. quite rightfully so, after exactly. all these years. You know, it, it, the, whole, the whole point about doing Daleks was sort of, a pure mad tribute to the whole TV 21 Dalek mania thing, mm. uh, which was a thing that we, we all just, we enjoyed the brightness, the vibrancy. You know, there are some people who got in touch to say, well, it's not photorealistic, is it? And we went, no, it's, it's bright. It's pop arty. It's, mm. it's a little bit silly and extravagant because that's what's great about TV 21 and bless Doctor Who magazine for reprinting the Dalek strips when the first issue oh. went out. So I think suddenly you got people going, oh, wow, this is crazy. But, mm. you know, it's, it's exactly that world of, of Dalek madness. I, I had somebody get on, in touch with me on Twitter when Daleks was announced to sort of say, well, you know, this is a Nazi sympathizing thing oh, by boy. doing this. And you're like, <laughs> oh, well, goodness. I mean, that's a read. Um, but really, it's just a celebration of these awful, awful monsters. And mm. the fact that in those original comic strips, the mechanoids are like the slightly sassier versions of them. Mm. And, you know, the, the great thing about Daleks is that we absolutely got away with uh, making the mechanoids women. Nobody noticed that because people were just furious that we'd misspelt mechanoids with an A. <laughs> I and saw that and I was like, what's that? Like, it's one letter. Like, can we all just 
I know. know and the thing is, you know, if you look at all the merchandise from the 1960s, it's spelt with an A. Mm. Oh, but In they don't all... like to bring that up. We don't yeah. want to talk about that. So you know, it's, it's, that's how it's spelled. And yeah. since David Whitaker and Terry Nation wrote those strips, they they went. Do you know what? And if you and if you look at uh, how uh, Terry Nation names planets, the Iridians of Iridius, the Visians of Vis- you know all of that. Uh, of course, it's going to be the Mechanoids of Mechanus, because otherwise mm-hmm. it's the Mechanoids of Mechanos. Uh, and you're just like. Wait, there is a Mykonos joke there, but that's the point. You know, it's the fact that it is the mechanoids of Mechanus. That that's mm. how you know, that's how Terry Nation named things. And you can argue about what it was in the various drafts of the shooting script, but you were also there going, it's about two different ways on screen. But the joyous thing was that there was a certain pocket of fandom. Uh, you know, Chris Allen, the producer of Daleks, would occasionally send me screenshots. There was a certain pocket of fandom who were so furious about that, they forgot to be upset that the mechanoids were now women. And it's, so you know, it was all a good plan. It all paid off. So. I know. We, we actually managed cunning misdirection um, <laughs> by complete accident. Uh, uh, but now, now we've said this, you can just bet somebody's going to look up and go, wait, 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 what? Uh, women? Monsters are, can be women? What? <laughs> and it's just like, they're bitchy hexagons, and now you care about their gender. Um, you know, no, it's it insane. And like the whole the whole mechanoid spelling thing, it just reminds me of people, of like those who said, I remember when um, Hyde went out, the Matt Smith episode, and he said Metabellis instead of Metabelis, and people are going, he said it wrong! He said it wrong! And I'm like, does it really matter? Like, we all know what he's talking. Do you know what I mean? I was just like, tomato, tomato. Like, does it really matter? Like, yeah, I mean, it, it quietly matters at two o'clock in the morning. I bet you've woken oh. up. Uh, oh, yeah. Night after transmission, I was like, wait, he's, he said Metabellis. Like, so. Yeah. You know, but uh, apart apart from those little moments, but you know that that is the joy that there there is always going to be something a bit wrong and wonky in Doctor Who. But at the same time, you're there going, how many planets has the Doctor visited? They're bound to get the pronunciation of one of them wrong every now and then. Yeah, absolutely. And just back on your DVD work, because as you said, you've contributed to the the DVD range. Um, one thing when I was looking through your various works is you were responsible for the animated episodes of The Invasion or getting that on the DVD, which, of course, was the, I believe, the first time missing episodes have been animated, I think. Yes, I that was yeah. uh, that was the idea of my lovely friend Andy Harris down the pub one evening, um, who was just like, oh, you know, you, you make all these silly little Doctor Who animations. So I think we'd just done Scream of the Shalker. Hmm. Uh, and he went, oh, you know, you should really look at, at doing that with a missing episode. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. And then there's a very weird way that funding used to work at the BBC in those days, where at the end of the financial year, what would happen is that whatever money was spare in the department, somebody would literally run up and down shouting figures. Right. And it was kind of like a bidding auction in that you'd spend the entire year sort of living off Tesco hoops from your cupboard. And then there's this one week in March where they're running up and down, yelling out fabulous sums. And you basically sort of stick your hand up and say, I can spend that. And there was this extraordinary sum of money. And I just stuck my hand up and said, oh, I can do that. I can make a Doctor Who cartoon. And they're like, you can. And I was like, yep. And they went, well, there we go. That's a deal. And I got in touch with um, Steve Marr and John Doyle from Cosgrove Hall because they'd done Ghosts of Albion. They'd done Scream the Shelker. And John Doyle was the animation lead on Daleks. Uh, you know, John Doyle is an industry animation legend. Mm. And we basically got Cosgrove Hall to do two black and white animated episodes of Doctor Who for quite a decent budget. Um, you know, especially in those days. And that was done just just as a development thing. So I remember a few weeks later, the, the uh, financial controller was like, so this Doctor Who cartoon, what is it? And I explained, and he just did that whole, oh, all right then. Um, but you know, it's a fascinating bit of R and D research into can this thing be done? And the answer was yes, it could, and it looked amazing. Uh, and then trying to find a broadcast window, just working out what to do with it. Um, and you know, on the one hand, there's a tiny bit of me that goes, if I was better 
at being a BBC manager, being a BBC producer, we could have got more made at the BBC while I was there. Um, but on the other hand, you know, without the invasion, I don't think there would be any of the animations that have fired on. But no, absolutely. I mean, to, to go from, oh, we'll animate two missing episodes, and now obviously you're getting releases of six part stories that are all animated and they're doing color versions and all this sort of stuff. Like, I think the invasion definitely set the precedent for that. And I mean, it, yeah, it seems it, like now they're just going to keep doing it until they're all they're all done. Or well, that's how it yeah. seems anyway. So but it was it was heartbreaking back in like 2006, 2007, when we were doing the Infinite Quest, when we had a Doctor animation on BBC One. Mm. Um, you know, we, we had all of this stuff happening, but trying to get a, a budget to do more animations was just very, very difficult because uh, we nearly had the budget to do Power of the Daleks back then. But internal politics at Two Entertain. See, I can say internal politics at Two Entertain now because Two Entertain are long gone. <laughs> um, but it really was, you know, Dan Hall who was sort of the intermediary, and you know, Dan Hall was a, such a champion of the DVD range. But he had to basically go into a board full of hard-nosed business people mm. and say, "I would like some money to do this." And there was yeah. there was so much internal shenanigans over underpaying for the invasion. And there was so much contract wrangling because it started out with uh, to entertain saying that they would stump up 50% of the budget. And my boss went, you know, what? that's actually viable. We, mm -hmm. we, could, we could definitely do Power of the Daleks if they come up with 50% of the budget. We can put the rest of it out on iPlayer when it launches. That's fine. And then to entertain started being canny with money. Uh, and it ended up with the, they'd looked at a contractual clause and they'd said, we actually have a contractual clause where we can take this for free from the BBC archives. So we're not going to pay you any money. We're just going to take this for free from the BBC archives. To which my response was, it's not in the BBC archives. It's in a cupboard in White City. Only I know where it is and only I have the key. Your move. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, it's the only time I have ever had anything like a spine at work. Mm. Um, but, you know, we got the money out of them, but they, they reduced their money offering by a little bit. At which point yeah. my head of the department was like, oh, let's not go through the pain of doing this. So, you know, we, we, we nearly did Power of the Daleks in 2007. You know, there was nice. test footage. Still remember showing that to David Tennant and him being like, oh, this looks really good. And we like, yes, it is. And, <laughs> then, and then just that terrible thing where it's like to entertain were just difficult, difficult people to deal with. Hmm. Um, and I remember one of the people who was most political um, and most responsible for torpedoing Power of the Daleks back then um, was just like, so anyway, I've, I've marked off time I don't have next March to work on Power of the Daleks. And I was going, it's not happening. And he was going, but I've marked off time. It's happening. And you're going, you've torpedoed it, mate. It's not happening. Yeah, it's done. Like, get it, <laughs> move and on. And just but... this look of shock. And you go, look, if you're, if you're going to turn up and be a hard bastard, yeah. don't expect people to want to work with you again. You know, it's That's a real... It failing but you know i i had a brilliant champion called mark cossey who was trying to get more of the animations funded within the bbc and he came back from a meeting with bbc3 and said right they want to do them but in color and only 10 minutes long uh, oh yeah the power of the daleks in 10 minutes that that works <laughs> just... but no literally <laughs> cutting each episode down oh, to 10 minutes oh god no. there you go. uh... Yeah, that's... That face, the face yeah. that you're pulling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was <laughs> just like, well, what about... And he was like, well, no, because... And, and it, was, it, it was still the hangover of that old, whole thing about not being allowed to embrace the history of a show. It was that whole, oh, it's Doctor Who, it's shit, in it. And you're like, it's not! Yeah. You know, what's the most popular programme on TV at the moment? Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame, though, as well, because, I mean, that was definitely the angle I felt was pushed. I mean, I think the only way I got into the classic series when I was a kid, thankfully, was because, again, when David Tennant shows up at the end of Parting of the Ways and having never seen Doctor Who going, who's this man? What's going on? Thankfully, my dad, knowing all about it, told me, and that's what made me want to go and seek out the old stuff. I think kids have that thing, you know, they want to learn, they want to embrace it because, you know, I was watching, you know, like the Three Doctors and a lot of the Hooray! 60s and 70s stuff. But I wasn't thinking, oh, look at that effect. How bad's that? Or because I was like, you know, I was nine. I was, I was in the wonder of it. Wow, they're in this 
alternate dimension and there's these bubbly Gelgard monsters. Like, they look a bit cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was so fascinating. But what? whenever I tried to show that to my friends, be like, oh, let's watch like a John Pertwee Doctor Who. I think partly because their parents may have said, oh, yeah, the old Doctor Who's not very good. They'd be like, oh, well, this isn't very good, is it? And I was like, oh, come on. So, like, knew who I could talk about in the playground. Classic Who for, for ages was like my own little, you know, my own little pocket of, oh, well, I like this stuff. So, But, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Because when I was a kid, I think that the first Doctor Who I actually watched and knew was Doctor Who was The End of Logopolis, which left me completely baffled. <laughs> like, yeah. he's dead. Yeah. Uh that's weird. And then um the the BBC then ran the five faces of Doctor Who season, which you know, I cannot describe the excitement of it, but imagine not really knowing what the show was and getting an unearthly child and then the Crotons and then the <laughs> Carnival of Monsters and then the three doctors and then Logopolis again and suddenly going, Oh my god, I get this. Yeah. And then Castrovelva happened not long afterwards, at which point I was like there are no other television programs. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the fact that as a kid, I was there, I was aware that I was watching an ancient, ancient text. When I was watching The Three Doctors, I was aware of just how terrifying the old television was because I was watching a show that was like seven years old. Mm. At the time, sort of the idea of watching a John Pertwee story, it felt like reaching back into the misty, misty dawns of time. And it's like, nah, really, really, it's not that old. It's not yeah. the 80s. Just relax. Yeah. Um, no, that five faces of Doctor Who, I remember seeing, because again, my first classic Who was The Three Doctors. Brilliant story, by the way. And um, it had the uh, five faces of Doctor Who, you know, teaser on it on the DVD extras. And I remember watching that. And b because it was my first, again, it was like, you know, windows into other eras. Because, oh, here's a clip of the very first story. Here's a clip of Patrick Troughton in The Crotons. And again, as, like, as a nine-year-old, it's like, whoa, like, this show really leaps about in terms of what it does. And, oh, this one's in black and white. And and again, though, that never... I mean, did you have that when Five Faces was on? Because, like, for me, the whole... The year is in black and white. That just never... I never remember that being, like, a, a barrier for me. I was just yeah, like, oh, yeah, it's in black and white. Like Getting so to what? watch an unearthly child and just going, this is amazing. Having no idea what it was. And just watching it going, this is just... You know, it's so atmospheric because there's all that, that dry ice. And it's so mad. Yeah. You know, I even enjoyed the three episodes set in the caves. You know, you know how, you know, as an adult, you have to go, oh, yeah, and then there are three episodes in the caves. But yeah. actually, as a kid, you're just like, this is so mad. I don't know what this is, and I'm haunted by it. Yeah. Um, and no, then to go from that to Patrick Troughton without any apology. Hmm. You just expect as an audience to just go, don't worry, Doctor Who is now this. Yeah. No, and I think that's it. Uh, maybe that, as you say, that, oh, let's not embrace the history is maybe with what you said about the, the politics behind getting the animations done, because it was quite a gap between the invasion and I think the next one on DVD, I want to say it was the Reign of Terror in 2013, but I could be wrong. But it was yeah. quite a gap, wasn't it, between between the two yeah that was a really weird period of uh, I, I think the best way to describe it is fuckerance um, <laughs> oh i like that fuckerance where uh, the the bbc launched a tender process to animate i think it was the abominable snowman the ice warriors uh evil of the daleks and something else and cosgrove hall and i put together a pitch for this tender process and we got an email saying congratulations you have won the tender process we don't have any money we're going to go away and find the money and that was the last we ever heard so we we're there going oh it'd be nice to get to do some more animations it'd be nice to get to do some more animations and then all of a sudden the reign of terror came out and we were like mm. oh so i guess having won the tender process we didn't win the tender process uh yeah. it's, it's one of the S few sad reasons why um, I don't watch any of the new animations, not because they're not good, but because literally just the idea of them just reminds me about what a terrible, terrible failure I was as a BBC producer. Cause it's like, Oh, no, I, I, I guess that's, that's not your fault. Out of the Daleks made many years ago and then got screwed over in a complicated tendering process by people who no longer work there and have no idea that whenever anybody goes, have you heard the amazing news about what they're animating next? My response is just, oh, it was a terrible, terrible BBC producer. 
Oh, but that can't solely be like, that can't be placed down to you. I mean, if they said you won and then never got in touch, I mean, like how, like, that's like, you know, as an actor, when you audition for something and they say, oh yes, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch by this date, whether you've got it or not. And you never hear anything, but you've cleared your calendar just in case they come back and say, yep. yes, we want you for two weeks. And I mean, I mean, that's still a big problem in itself, you know, not hearing back from things, but that, but I feel you on that one because especially with a project like that, like you say, you'd, you'd done the invasion. That was a success. You've been trying to get money together. You'd done test pitches. And then I guess to finally be told in an official email, yes, you've won. It's happening. Give us some time. We'll get some money, but we'll do it. And then to not hear anything. I, I completely understand your reasons for not delving into the new animations. Cause it's, as you say, essentially they, to put it mildly, they fucked you over in that sense. Well, so. I think we, I, I don't think there was any intentional fucking over. Hmm. I, I think it's just fuckerance, which is hmm. a different thing. Fuckerance happens. You know, to entertain was uh, a different beast in that there were some people who worked at to entertain who saw themselves as such hard-nosed successful businessmen that they completely tanked the company. Um, but I think it was different in that case in that it was, it was just one of those things where I think they ran the tender process and forgot to check that there was any money behind the tender process, which is not how tender processes are supposed to run. And I think when they finally went, how much money do we have for this? They then went, Oh, we've only got a, enough for a couple of episodes. Oh, let's do the reign of terror. Um, you know, a, a lot of people see, incredibly complicated conspiracies and complicated stuff and more often than not it's just nice people having a slightly off day uh and you know much as i much as i might sort of child me would have gone well i'm definitely setting fire to their car or if i'm not setting fire to their car i'm definitely leaving a haddock in their bush uh you know grown up me is like uh happens you know yeah. you end up at the end of it going oh I don't quite know why that happened, but I feel vaguely sad. But also, you know, because I've been working at the BBC for a year, I've actually got to meet some of the teams who are working on the new animations and they're brilliant, lovely people. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just a thing of, it's like, you are a brilliant, lovely person doing something absolutely brilliant. And if it's all right with you, I just won't watch it because I think I would just spend two and a half hours just sitting there going, why wasn't I better at my job in 2006? Which, you know, if that just means that for the rest of my life, I only get to listen to Fury from the Deep on the brilliant cleaned up CD version, then so be it. Uh, yeah. You know, li life will continue. I will make my peace with it. Um, and obviously when Dalek's master plan happens, then I, will, I will just throw everything out of the window and just go, yes, but you know, we all have to put everything to one side to watch the glorious madness when the BBC eventually gets around to doing Dalek's master plan. Woohoo! Oh, I can't um, wait for that day. As much yeah. as every, you know, as, as much as we all hope that the remaining nine missing episodes turn up, you know, I don't know, in a ditch in Dorset or something like that, you know, even just the prospect of watching it, even in animated form, would be, well, I'd say an event, a 12 part story event, just insane. Yeah. And also, you know, there, there's going to be a glorious outcome to it because either we're all going to watch it and go, this is every bit as amazing as we've always dreamed, or we're going to watch it and go, we all have, now have to go out and get really, really drunk. Yeah. It's funny with stories like that. It actually, that segues nicely into um, some uh, just quick fire questions I was going to ask you. Nothing serious, but um, I've, I've, on my notes, I've labeled it Desert Island Who, just because it was like Desert Island is sort of thing. But um, on that, like you say, there, are, I think there are some stories in Doctor Who where the fandom, you know, generally love it. You hear nothing but praise. You know, this story is brilliant. Some of the best of all time. And then you might have that one, but then you might think, oh, well, but I don't think that. But then you're like, oh, but if I say it on Twitter, people will come out. What? Adam, you don't like City of Death as much as I do? What, do you know what I mean? Do you, have a, do you have a story that works both ways? Either a story that's universally loved, but you're like, I'm not as for it. Or a story that's universally not as loved but you love it anyway no oh, i i think you're i think now one of the great things about twitter is that people are actually allowed to come out and just go do mm. you know what yeah that one but you know for me four to doomsday i have so much time for four to doomsday and nobody else does <laughs> and i will just sit there and go whatever you think about it is absolutely correct but still four to doomsday please 
uh, you know, I'm not doing down any of the other brilliant stories in that season, but there is something magical about Four to Doomsday that I, you, you know, that there are some bits about Doctor Who that just chime with you yeah, in a way that you cannot explain, you cannot justify, but you just sit there and go, yeah, but that moment when Persuasion looks out the window and goes, oh, the poor are always with us, Doctor. And you just go, that is my programme. And, you yeah. know, Doctor Who throwing himself out into the void on an office chair, um, frantically miming a way that he's in gravity. You just go, the ambition of this lovely little show that we all adore. Yeah. You know, and it was the it was the first one Peter Davison recorded, wasn't it? If I've got my facts straight. I so. think you probably have. Um mm. yeah, but you know, that's it, it's Fort of Doomsday exists and it's joyous. You know, in the same way that there are stories like the Android invasion where a lot of people are a bit sort of like uh, it's not very good and you go yeah but how many times have you watched it all the all the time that you bang on about oh my god this peerless historical is just so wonderful and you're like yeah but you have watched the android invasion more times haven't you own up yeah oh my no, god completely. you just have to watch the recon of the massacre it's just so moving you're like yeah yeah yeah, yeah but come on it's a good plan stigron uh, <laughs> yeah. you know there, there, there's there, there's that sort of um almost intellectual sneeriness about Doctor Who fans of going, yes, but that story is just fun, isn't it? Mm. And you think, and the problem is? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as as I mentioned briefly, like, I have that with um, City of Death in the sense, I do enjoy it. I don't think it's a bad story by any means, but, you know, it has this, this like, universal love, like, you know, everyone loves the script and the setting and everything. And, I, you know, I, I enjoy it, but I don't know what it is. I think maybe because as a kid, you know, when you get online and like you're in forums and reading what people think are the best stories, City of Death for me got so hyped up, you know, as being this insanely best of all time Doctor Who story that I think when I watched it, I think I was just like, oh, I didn't think it was like that. But like you say, Twitter, I've done that recently saying, oh, I don't think City of Death's all that good. And people, as you say, are less scathing, but more curious now. Like, oh, how come you think that? And it gives you outlet to explain your reasons rather than someone just going, no, you're incorrect. You aren't a Doctor Who fan if you don't like City of Death, you know? So. But, you know, you're, you're allowed not to because uh, exactly. I, I, I live through the madness of uh, Tomb of the Cybermen, where people would assure you that Tomb of the Cybermen was absolutely the best that Doctor Who ever was. And you would read the book obsessively maybe like once a week and go oh my god the book of tomb of the simon is missing and then you would listen to the really really faint fuzzy audios and you'd be like oh my god the audio of tomb of the Cybermen is amazing and then at some point in the like late 80s there was a really good quality audio of tomb of the Cybermen, and people were like oh my god it's really amazing it's absolutely astonishing and then tomb of the Cybermen came back and you're like i will finally get to see this and you watch it and you go that's all right and it's horrible because you can't actually explain it. And it's not that Tomb of the Cybermen is all right because it's great, but because you've been told it's amazing, you have this real thing of it's amazing. And you're watching it and you're going, do all the Cybermen just stand around going wibbly wee for two minutes? And, and you know, it, it's your head, your little teenage head is there going, I am watching Tomb of the Cybermen. I can't believe I'm watching Tomb of the Cybermen. At the same time, you're going, they are going wibbly wee, wibbly wee, wibbly wee. And as soon as you realize that, and all the little joyous details that you pick out, like the fact the Cybermen have stools, mm, and scatter yeah. cushions with Cyberman faces on. And you go, so do the Cybermen sit on their faces to have tea in the Cyberman cafe in the lobby of their... You know, it's, it, it's all of those little details of Tomb of the Cybermen that just, when you're supposed to be sitting there going, oh my God, this is just like the epitome of Doctor Who. And instead of which you just go... Yeah, but there's, and then, you know, as the years go past, you start to love it because of that, rather mm. than despite it. It's yeah. very hard to explain. Um, mm. You know, I think fans of stuff like um, Star Trek Voyager are able to love it despite itself. And mm. Doctor Who fans are just there going, oh, we've been doing this for so much longer than you. Yeah, I think it works the other way as well. Like I remember before Enemy of the World got recovered, um, its reputation to me, at least, you know, we only had episode three, I had the Lost in Time set, and you watch episode three on its own, and, you know, I was sort of like, oh, okay, that 
this seems like a story, you know. And I remember the reputation was sort of, yeah, Enemy of the World's quite dull, despite the fact there was an audio release and all that sort of stuff. And then as soon as it came back and we all watched it, we were like, wow, like this is this is debatably one of like the best Trout and Era stories ever. So I, I love the know. fact that Opinion just completely 180'd as soon as we were able to see it. Exactly, you know, that that is the best example I can possibly think of. And I, I remember I was... I, I was uh, in a very tragic relationship at the time, my boyfriend had had just discovered the wonders of, of drugs. Ah. And so would just go vanishing for days to take mysterious drugs with mysterious Romanian strangers. Uh, and unfortunately, it was during the weekend that Enemy of the World and the Web of Fear came back. So I was like, oh, I'm really happy, but also I'm really sad because my boyfriend is missing on a group sex binge. And he sort of came staggering in at some point and went, right. Uh, so shall we watch some TV? And I'm like, yeah, we could watch Web of Fear. I've not seen Web of Fear yet. And we sat watching Web of Fear as he was coming down from whatever mad things he'd been doing. And I'd forgotten to tell him that episode three was just in telesnaps. Mm. So we got 10 minutes into episode three of the Web of Fear and he just turned to me and grabbed my hand and went, the pictures aren't moving. Help me. And having to suddenly explain BBC archival procedures from the 1970s to somebody who's tripping off his biscuits, whilst you're at the same time going, I'm watching The Web of Fear. This is the first time I've ever got to watch The Web of Fear in my life. And you are absolutely fucking ruining it. <laughs> because of oh. your love of strange group drug sex with Romanian nutters. Only you could ruin The Web of Fear episode three. Oh, man. I mean, I think I was... I was only the the one major gutting for me about episode three was of course it's the first episode the brigadier ever appears and it's or like ah not. we will or, never know we will or not who knows <laughs> but um no I just remember like those two stories that was that I mean we all know it was huge and like see it again but the, the web of fear I think for the most part from what I've seen online lived up to because that was another one that was like oh this is a really good story like it's really atmospheric and episode one's really atmospheric and then most of the rest of it came back and I, I remember being like yeah that was pretty good like people said it is like that is a pretty yeah. damn good story yeah, and um, there's, there's a, an utter joy to the fact that the, the web of fear now exists yeah. i remember there, there was an evening not long ago where we were watching the web of fear with lee binding and and lee is now a very very old man and <laughs> and he fell asleep during it and he woke up at the end and went oh wow i've just slept through the web of fear i never thought i'd get to do that bless him <laughs> oh man i mean it's so and it's also i mean we say about episode three of course that's being redone now so that's that's something i guess but um yeah i just i love that yeti story and i'm excited i i, I think actually out of all the missing stories still gone aside from dalek's master plan of course we all want that back but um i'd actually think i'd like to see abominable snowmen return again just to see the yeti Origins. I know it's probably not, you know, as people say, it's maybe not as dark or atmospheric as Web of Fear, but the Yeti, I think, look great in black and white. They work so well in black and white. Yeah, you know, as as a child, there's, there was a real magic to all of the Troughton stories because they were so unknowable. You know, the, the idea that the only Troughton story I'd ever get to see was the Crotons, and that seemed quite likely. Mm. Um, so just devouring all of those Terence Dick's books and just, you know, the haunting joy of discovering that, you know, the Abominable Snowman I, is is the target book in that it's like 20, 30,000 words long and it's magical. And there is, there is a whole universe in the book of the Abominable Snowman. And you sit there and you go, wow, this is so good. Um, and yeah, all of those Troughton stories, just, you know, where, when I grew up, the fact that Fury from the Deep was novelised and novelised as a bit longer because mm. Victor Pemberton had got so excited by it. And finally, at some point, when I was a little bit older, getting to hear Fury from the Deep. And then when Mark Ayers did those amazing restorations and you could actually hear Fury from the Deep rather than sort of hope. Um you know, when, when I grew up, uh, there, there was the famous audio recording of Marco Polo, which you must have heard snippets of, which is... Yeah. And, you know, it, it just, you know, just the idea that we, we squinted so hard with our ears to try and 
understand the majesty of these lost television things and the fact that there are whole departments there are industries devoted to going no we want to recreate these as much as possible so that people can fall in love with them the fact that there are young fans of Doctor Who now who just sit there and go oh my god the macro terror is amazing uh is is insane mm. no it's it's really coming to its own in that respect absolutely um the next thing I've got on my Desert Island Who list is a dream team, which is, in an ideal world, doesn't have to be one that existed on screen. What is your top TARDIS team if you were in charge? Who would you put together? Oh, Christ. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I mean, it, it's an obscurity, isn't it? Um, mm. I think uh, you probably couldn't get Catherine Hepburn as the Doctor because she's so dead Ooh. now. Yeah. Um, but you know, you you you'd, you'd definitely want Catherine Hepburn. I always thought would make an amazing Romana, but now it's like fuck it, Catherine Hepburn as the Doctor would Hell be yeah. amazing. Mm. Um, you know, you can just imagine her with 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 the long cigarette thing, be like Tha, Davros, <laughs> and that would be incredible. So <laughs> yeah, you know, the the TARDIS would be mostly stairs, so that she'd constantly be making an entrance. <laughs> um, but it would just be this sort of like, I am wise cracking my way through all of this. Yes, 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 yes. And three outfit changes on every single planet, no matter what's going on. So she would probably have to have an assistant who would be quite dowdy, mm. possibly a Ben Wishaw or a Tom Hiddleston, you know, sort of definitely dowdied down mm. uh, and just constantly carrying around a variety of coats and capes for her while she's just there being like, wow, so the Cyberman. <laughs> Uh, that that would just be an absolute hooting joy. Um, but you know, more practically, Archie Punjabi would be brilliant because mm. um, she was she was magnetic in The Good Wife. She really was. Um, just watching her turn up in that series and go, "Oh, I think I'm stealing this series." Uh, and you know, even the way that Christine Baranski would just be in the background, and go, "Oh no, you go, you go for it, you go for it." Mm. What, what do you add? Oh, this is just like, but but my show. This is my show and there's Archie Panjabi going so anyway also I own a motorbike brum brum <laughs> you know that she has real big doctor energy hmm well finger I mean fingers crossed I, that, I always love that though when the, there's the new casting because since the doctor can literally be played by anyone like it's such an excitement as like we're doing now like hypothesizing oh but what if it's so and so and wouldn't so and so be amazing doing this like it's such it's such a joy every time it comes around I think yeah, but also I think the answer is anybody is going to be amazing being the Doctor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you you probably sit there with your... You, you've probably got your special theories. My, my what? Sorry, my special you've theories. Got your, you've got your special theories where you're like, oh, yeah, well, for season one, it would be this. And then well, I, well, I'd move <laughs> up for series two. But Yeah, you I've know, dabbled there, here and there. <laughs> it's like the, the introduction to uh, Russell's script book for the first series where he's like, Romeo Beckham, huh. Oh that could work <laughs> um you know it's very much that um mm. but you just think oh yeah that that could work yeah no it's true anything could work and speaking of working more so for you uh, the next thing is i call well it's called old faithful which is is there any era or see or season of the show that you find you either go back to the most or when you're having a down day, you can rely on the most, just the most rewatchable era or season of the show, I guess. Yeah, not really. No? No, it's it's just mm. what, what you know. Where the mood takes you? Yeah, it's like at the moment, every now and then my, my head just keeps on going, oh, you should probably rewatch the Romans at some point. <laughs> And you know, a comedy you, classic considered by Twitter these days. Yeah, <laughs> so. you, you you have to wait till the heart picks you up. You know, every now and then, you might hear the call of the censorites and go, "I must obey." Uh, yeah. These things happen. Um, I had know. that with Planet of Giants, which after rewatching it, I was like, "Okay, this is brilliant." You know, not that I didn't think it was before, but yeah, like so, especially with those old Hartnell and Troughton stories, when you go back every now and then. And most times you come away being like, wow, like that was the 60s. and That was a brilliant achievement, what they did. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It, you, you just have to wait for the call to come around. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, getting to the end now. Do you have a favourite special scene that just calls to you? Special scene. Uh, 
a special scene. I don't know about a specific scene, but one season I found myself that I've been able to go back to a lot for no real particular reason, and I love it each time, is John Pertwee's very first season, season seven. Oh, now that which... is that is the correct answer. I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh... That's all right. It's just such a... Because I'd argue it's the closest, especially in the classic series, it's the closest whoever got to being like... I guess if you wanted to call it like a straightforward adult drama. And I don't know, there's something quite engaging about it. Like it's, you could argue on one hand, it's the least who, but also the most who is at the same time. Like, I mean, Infer- I mean, we've all, we all, everyone's gushed about Inferno and it is absolutely brilliant. But I remember people saying, oh, well, the Ambassadors of Death isn't very good. And then I watched it and I was like, what are you talking about? Who like, this is brilliant. People? It's so they- wonderful. And even though it's seven four episodes, bangers. Like, that Ab- is... Yeah, four bangers. No misses. No misses at all. And like, that's what I mean. Despite them being seven episodes, you know, people typically say, oh, well, the longer they are, the more, I don't know, boring is not the right word, but the more like padding there is and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, there's there's padding, but I can watch any of those season seven stories and I'm never bored, even though I've watched them several times. They're engaging. The performances are brilliant. And e- Pertwee's brilliant right from the word go, in my opinion. He's, I and, mean, they all are. So. Well, per- Pertwee's also likable, because um, mm, mm. and and this is this is as as near as I'm going to get to Twitter cancellation, probably. <laughs> but the, some of the some of Pertwee has aged quite badly, you know, especially yes. in the demons, which I loved when I was a child. And then you watch it as an adult, and you go, well, "He's just horrible to everyone." No wonder they end up tying him to the stake and trying to burn him alive. Because yeah. he turns up in that village and he's like, you are a barman. You are silly. You are a man with a moustache. You are awful. Oh, Joe, yeah. you can't read a map. And you're just watching it going, no. And it is weird that I think they sort of tone him down a little bit after the demons because he spends all of that season. You've got Roger Delgado being a much better doctor than the master in that season. You know, I think this is part of a deliberate joke by Terence Dix. Hmm. Where, you know, the master is at his most charming and John Pertwee's doctor is at his least charming through that season. But you end up at the end of the season going, Oh, I love him. I absolutely love yeah. Dr. Who. Um, yeah. But you're right. Season seven, Pertwee is just, he's so capable in that season and he's so morally right and he's charming. And he and Liz have such a great rapport with each other. And the astonishing thing is realizing that, If you watch, I don't know, The Seeds of Death and The Silurians, they were made in the same year and they are a completely different program. And, you know, I'm not doing either of the stories down, but there there is just a sheer professionalism to season seven. You're so right to pick it because it's it's just, you know, every now and then when, when you stop worrying about in the middle of the night, how Metabilis is pronounced. You can sit there and go, why didn't they do it all on film? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I think it's just as well, I'd, I'd argue it's it's a time when I think the BBC for the classic series was like, you know, oh, it's the before and after, you, you know, the, you, a lot of people had the approach, oh, it's this, it's this funny kids show that adults like, you know, with monsters in rubber suits and whatnot. But I feel that 1970 series is really when, both the BBC was trying to be like, no, like this is a serious show that is that kids can enjoy, but we're taking this seriously and you should take it seriously as well. Yeah. You know, there, there was a real uh, maturity to it and, and, you know, no less inventive, no less charming, but suddenly because it was set on earth, there was a real uh, weight to the plots hmm. and you know, the, the fact that it's very hard to understand exactly what is going on in Ambassadors of Death, but the point is, it's a conspiracy drama. You very rarely understand what's going on in a conspiracy drama. You know, it's, yeah. it's great. Um, yeah. yeah, you are so right to pick that. Um, a lot of people bash it as well for like, oh, it's they just go back and forth all the time. But I'm like, but I, I, that's one thing I find more enjoyable about it. It's like, Oh, but now they've got out. Oh, but now they've been, been been captured again. How now that they've figured out how they got out this time? How are they going to do it again? If that makes sense, it's like the continued fascination of yes, they are treading the same places, but something different's happening each time, and it's engaging. It's very engaging to watch. 
And it's also, you know, it's the first time you see the Doctor have rational conversations with the monsters because the monsters are no longer defaultly the villains. Mm. You know, it's yeah. a really interesting set of stories. But I think when when I was young, you only really had Spearhead from Space on VHS and the tantalising possibility of Inferno because those are the only two that were in colour. Mm. So the Silurians, I think, was a very late release and you'd sort of either watch a really bad pirate copy in black and white or an even worse pirate copy with flickers of colour in it. Mm. So watching the Silurians was a guaranteed migraine. Yeah. I know, they, people complain about what cyberpunk is doing to people with epilepsy now, but watching a VHS with vague colour of the Silurians back in the 1980s was absolutely like having sand rubbed in your eyes. But you would do it because you could sit there and go, I've seen it in colour now. Can't yeah. actually focus on anything, but I've seen bits of it. Yeah. I, well, actually, I watched The Ambassadors of Death recently. Um, I managed to get a, a VHS copy of it. And um, of course, when that came out on VHS, I think it was like 2002, quite late. But the restoration was at a point then where I think like half of it's in color, basically, yep. and then the other half's in black and white. But do you know what? The episodes in black and white, I was like, this really works in black and white. Like, it's very up. There's some wonderful. Um, atmospheric moments in black and white um it's the cliffhanger i think it's episode two where you know the probes just come back and they're trying to the voice is coming out but they're just repeating the same thing and pertwee's doing that how many how many beans make five and it's the camera's constantly zooming in and yeah. cutting and cutting it's really tense before he goes right cut it open and that in black and white i don't know what it is it feels even more tense because you've only got the two main tone colors to work with and yeah i think it's brilliant in black right, and white. It, it's like the dinosaur and the silurians which uh is is supposed to be very bad cso but when you've grown up watching it in black and white you're like no it looks completely convincing to me absolutely and I, I was mad when i found out for the first time that that series i guess more than the rest of pertwee would have only been watched in color by like five percent of the population on broadcast because color tvs were so expensive so it's like i mean they say that don't they a lot of people watch the pertwee era on transmission in black and white just because they didn't have a a color set yet i suppose which to us now is like what why would you do that but i guess then it was a a necessity yeah and it's also the weird thing that you know not it, it's very rare to have seen a pertwee story as it was supposed to have been seen because most of them you know, the work that the restoration team have done to try and put some colour back into that footage is astonishing, but it still has that sort of fizzy murk to it. it it's hard mm. to describe, um, you know, watching the trailer for the forthcoming season eight Blu-ray, you, you sort of get the idea, oh, wow, they might have actually done it. But it, it's just the fact that they've just painstakingly tried to stick the colour onto the picture and get the colour to stay there. But it still has that that look like you put it in the wash a bit too high. Mm. Um, so it's it's just the feeling that you know that the Pertwee era is the most vibrant that Doctor Who's ever been because they were going, we're in colour! Yeah, exactly. But, and of course, colour being so new then at the time <coughs> as well. BBC only going over, I think it was... I think it was November 69 BBC One kicked over to full time. So, of course, you know, then season seven starting two months later. So, yeah, of course they want to be like, look, colour, colour everywhere. Buy a colour set, please. Please buy a colour licence fee. I know. So, I, I, I love all the rumours that um, the Dominators, that, that there, there's a, the Dominators was made in colour. There's, there's a, it's possible to get the colour back into the Dominators. And you're just there going, don't yeah don't yeah. do that i mean like the dominators i always try and find now when i rewatch who even if it's stories i don't love as much i'm always like what joy can i take from this very marie kondo um and i rewatched the dominators and i was it finished and i was like no <laughs> i was like there's not, aside from you know the tardis team who i think are brilliant trout and jamie and zoe but aside from that i was just like this story is kind of dull <laughs> yeah and the you know the fact that even after they took an episode out of it it's Just... still weird yeah and, it... you know i i grew up reading the book of the dominators by ian martyr which is you know he's managed to make it a gripping science fiction thriller uh that is also a morality tale and then you watch the thing on the screen you're going oh yeah, you're like, why is that character wearing a mattress and nothing else? Like, just yeah, yeah. There are some really strange 
dressing toys. I mean, one of the joys I've had of lockdown is watching Out of the Unknown, which is the series mm. made by Irene Shubik. Um, who in later life was, an, uh, was a deadly rival of Verity Lambert. And, and you watch uh, Out of the Unknown and you realise that there comes a certain point where Doctor Who starts to go, God, I really wish we looked like Out of the Unknown. Because Out of the Unknown, it turns out, had not very much more money than Doctor Who. And every episode of Out of the Unknown looks absolutely amazing. Mm. Uh, and also they managed to make all 45 minutes each week in a single studio block. So there's, there's that slight feeling where, because we have this perception as fans of, oh my God, the fact they managed to make 25 minutes of Doctor Who every week, of course we forgive it all of its rough edges. And then you watch Out of the Unknown that was made under the same conditions, but they managed to make twice as much of it in a week. And you just go, oh, yeah. what's going on? It really is, insane. especially going back to season seven again, how, you know, like how now, obviously with everything that's gone on this year, we're getting eight episodes in the in the new series and you, you know you still see some people say oh that's less episodes than ever before how must it have been in 1970 when you had it doctor on for 10 months of the year what they're only going down to six months this is a point like, you know i wonder if it was the it probably wasn't but it makes you think doesn't it like was it the same you know then as it is now or like when um from tom baker to peter davison you know oh we're going down from six months to three months now and we're on twice a week you know this is insane like it's yeah, but with, without that audience experimentation, we wouldn't have had EastEnders because that's how they went, oh, that's how that works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pressure of those first few years did not do anything to help William Hartnell's health and knackered Patrick Troughton. Mm. And that, I mean, that, that's the real shame, especially, you know, when that last season of Patrick Troughton's, you... If, if there hadn't been a Terence Dix frantically holding it together, what the hell would that last season of Patrick Troughton's been? Well, that's true. I mean, as, as, as well when you watch it, uh, like, sto like stories are so up and down in terms of like what just what they are. Like, as I say, you've got the Dominators, which is, you know, debatably a little bit dull. But then you've got like the, the sublime brilliance of the Mind Robber, which is like, let's throw everything in there. Let's do the weird and wacky wonderful stuff then you've got the invasion which is all earthbound and great then the crotons which i've always seen as like the dominant what the dominators should have been or could have yeah. been and then but it's just everywhere season six is just like here, here's a season like pick go watch you know yeah and you know the the war games which is a, a surprisingly watchable yeah. thing it's not meant to be 10 episodes long but it's an enjoyable 10 episodes um but you know, the only reason that happened was out of sheer desperation. You know, you, you look at the the spread of stories that they were intending to do that series and you realize that they just ended up going, what the hell have we got? Yeah, it's amazing, I think, when you look under pressure for either actors, writers, producers, like when you put under pressure with a limited budget or limited time, just what they can come up with. And, you know, sometimes, as you say, sometimes you look at it and go, oh, yeah, they didn't have a lot of time or money. But then on the other hand, like you say, with the war games, you're like, oh, my goodness, you would unless you knew you would never guess they were on. I'd argue you'd never guess they were on a time crunch or budgetary crunch or anything like that because it works so well. Yeah. But then yeah. You know, the war games has the most beautiful corridors in all of Doctor Who. But the fact that some <laughs> of them are made out of weather balloons. Yeah, absolutely. Extraordinary. And the final thing I wanted to ask you on this Desert Island Who thing, I've called it the Supreme Being, which is what's your ultimate Doctor Who story? And that can be anything, whether it's TV, audio, novel, just for you. What is what is the, super, it's the Supreme Being for you? God, that is a weird question, but I'm sure everybody says that when you ask them that question, and then they vacillate yeah. for about five minutes and then say, oh, it's probably the Five Doctors, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, it all comes back to the five doctors, yeah. <laughs> I, I think for me it is the invasion. Mm. Because, you know, I it, I've always loved the fact that it had those two missing episodes and it, it meant a lot to me to um get to finish off the invasion. And it is it is just mad, beautiful sixties bonkersness and you know, the fact that it was it was written in a cupboard in a hurry, but it's still great. You know, Doctor Who is at its best when it's written in a cupboard in a hurry. But other than that, it is definitely Stolen Earth and Journey's End because I was just like, oh my God, I'm not going to live through these. Oh, oh, I did. Oh, that's cool. 
Um, so, you know, that, that, that has that sort of, uh, I, I find it impossible to watch uh, all of them flying the TARDIS home without being in floods of tears, which is all a bit sort of like, oh, okay, those emotions then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's an extraordinary uh, two hours of Doctor Who. No, absolutely. I mean, we, we discussed earlier what where we were at when we watched it, but I think that sort of epitomised Doctor Who's night, new popularity, didn't it? Because I think wasn't Journey's End the very first time the show got to number one in the TV charts as well, I think. You'd have to Which... ask Tom Spilsbury. Yeah, yeah he's, the, he's the... I just remember that being such a thing in Doctor Who magazine. It was like, you know, they had the... Uh, segment about where it was in the ratings and i just remember reading like journey zen got to number one like after 45 years doctor is number one on the tv charts and i think for me that just sort of like yeah like this is this shows you can't knock it now surely like it's unstoppable and still is to many degrees unstoppable which is why we love it but um honestly james it's been such a pleasure chatting with you i mean i've been as you saw me mention it on twitter i've enjoyed your work not just on audio a lot of the stuff you've done. I've now shared you with my love for the website, all the old featurettes oh, on there as well. Thank you for I, making me feel so old. I'm so, I'm so, you're not the first person who said that to me, and I don't think you'll be the last. I think it's because your hair is so tall, you look older. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that's good. I'll keep doing that. It's a, It was a partly, partly fashion conscious thing, partly actor's choice, because you know when you're at drama school and they go, oh, everyone's got to be unique and look different. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll have big hair. But then it was also, I hate having, I have various eye conditions going on. And I used to hate having my fringe when it sits over my eyes. So I was like, I'm just going to put it all up. And then it's out of the way. And it's just, it's stuck, surprisingly. So, Well, keep it. I shall. I shall. As long as it, as long as it stays on my head, it shall stay. But honestly though james yeah thank you so much for well, no, coming on thank you i i have enjoyed this uh especially because at my age i managed to talk with somebody for two hours without having a wee which is absolute <laughs> bladder control winning oh bless you man no that's a we, we all we all get there in the end right we all get to that stage in the end you know anyone who's listening who's in their teens you're like maybe chuckling to yourself it, it will happen give it time it will happen but um yeah Hon no, honestly the, the 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 joy of a middle-aged wee when you just like <laughs> Oh, oh! I planned on doing some other nice things today, but I've had a wee now, so I'm all set yeah. up. But this, this is where it's at. Um, just before you go, is there anything, any of your work or uh, social media accounts you want to shout out at all? <laughs> no! <Dear> God, don't <laughs> follow me on social media. It's all about cats. Um, no, just, just you know, if, if you like what I do, that is lovely. And thank you. Because um, that is honestly the most cheering thing. But really, nah. Um, yeah, well, I very much enjoy what you do, and uh, just a big finish. If you're listening, can we have some more Jack? Can we have a Jackie Tyler box set, please? Because I loved Wednesday for Beginners, which I've mentioned on Twitter. It made me realise I want more Jackie Tyler content in my life. So, if anyone at Big Finish is listening, I would like a Jackie Tyler volume yeah. one, please that, and thank that, you. That was one of um, my happiest days in studio, just sending clips of it to Russell as we were recording it, and him just going, "Oh, box it now." <laughs> um, I mean, I never thought I would hear John Barrowman and Camille Kaduri sing a song together, and it was a very joyous moment hearing that. And I was like, "Yeah, this is this is up there for me." Yeah, but, um, it is. It is one of the happiest things I've ever done. That hmm, just for so many reasons, especially the recording day. Yeah. Well, there you go, guys. I mean, go and check out James's work. Uh, the thing we're talking about is Wednesday for Beginners, part of the Lives of Captain Jack box set, Volume One. Definitely go and check that out. Uh, James has written so much for Big Finish. Uh, you'll need that list to tick off. <laughs> and um, you can look on the like Wayback Machine, you know, like the look at internet pages as they were. Because I've done that a few times, look at the Doctor Who site as it was. I don't think you can interact with much anymore. You can't bring up... I think some videos you can bring up and some you can't. It's a really weird hit or miss system. But it's just... It's nostalgia for me. Because, of course, that's what I grew up with. All those old games and the little featurettes playing the last Dalek at school and Doctor Who Sudoku and all that sort of stuff. Like it was just brilliant. Oh, thank, thank you again for, wow. So my, <laughs> my work can be accessed through the way back machine. Wow. Yeah, I think, I Ouch. think, I think it's the way back machine, Ouch. but again, it's like, there was a thing on um, YouTube. Someone mentioned about those old, you know, those Doctor Who flash games on the website and people went to some efforts to get them running. Cause again, some of them, I guess it's partly to do with the code or something. Some of them do work fine, and some of them you need to like jump through various 
loopholes to get working. But honestly, man, if if you had any doubts, all your work on the website is still very much loved and remembered by those oh, of us who. I I, who went I still it. I still have copies of all of it on a hard drive under my bed. Um, <laughs> well, if you'd like to send me if you'd like to send me copies of the Doctor Who years, that'd be very much appreciated. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Christ, like... I probably I probably have got them somewhere. I I will I well, will have a look. Um, that would be incredible because I remember like last year. Um, oh, I'll watch those on YouTube now. But because of the music thing and the YouTube copyright system, there are some of some bits of it are there. But you'll watch it and you'll get like the first five minutes, and then the video will just go silent, and you're like, oh. They've blocked. They've blocked the sound because of copyright infringement. So, um, and, and as far as I know, I, I I did try on the way back machine and other means. I can't seem to find those original, you know, those original videos as they were complete, basically. So, at the minute, they're lost in time, as it were. <laughs> so. Wow, I, I I love the fact that stuff I've worked on has been wiped and is lost to memory, and that people care. Well, you might. I'm guessing people might be able to do it on the way back machine because I did try, and it was something like, "Oh, the the player or the code isn't compatible or doesn't exist anymore." Blah blah blah. But I'm sure someone with way more tech wizardry than me could probably find a way to get yeah, them well, going again. I think because all of the original real media files lived on a real media server, and nobody knows what real media is anymore. Yeah, um, it's it's, it, it's all a bit. Um, yeah, that that is tricky, but also. How brilliant that, you know, if I wanted to, I could sit down and I could watch all of Death Comes to Time now because yeah. I've got it all and I could be there going, it's all mine, it's all mine, I have it all. And everybody else you're, is there, no, you're good, you're good. You'll be, nah, you'll be like, if you announce that, people would be asking, you'd be like one of those rumoured collectors who are apparently hoarding ep missing episodes who are going, no, I'm not going to release this unless the BBC pays me £10 million or something like that, you know, I think... If you said you've got Death Comes to Time, I think people would be after it. <laughs> oh, well, that's my pension sorted. <laughs> Writing your ransom note to the BBC already. Like, if you would wish to purchase this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, I, I have such a relationship with the BBC that they just go, can we have it? And I'd be like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> no <What>? problem. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, James, once more, thank you so much yep. again. Thank been you an so much for having me on, Adam. No, not a problem, mate. And to all of you listening, uh, check out the podcast. Uh, you can either watch it on YouTube or we are available on all the main streaming platforms, Spotify, Google, Apple, and a bajillion others. Uh, go and check us out there. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And for myself, I shall catch you in the next episode.